This is Night by Ellie Weasel. Pages 1 through 10. Night. They called him the Mosh the Beetle, as though he had never had a surname in his life. He was the man of all work at a Hastic synagogue. The Jews of Seget, the little town in Transylvania where I spent my childhood, were very fond of him. He was very poor and lived humbly. Generally, my fellow townspeople, though they would help the poor, were not particularly fond of them. Mosh the Beetle was the exception. Nobody ever felt embarrassed by him. Nobody ever felt encumbered by his presence. He was a ma he was a past master in the art of making himself insignificant, of seeming invisible. Physically, he was as awkward as a clown. He made people smile with his walk of legal timid timidity. I loved his great dreaming eyes, their gaze lost in the distance. He spoke little. He used to sing, or rather to chant, such snatches as you could hear told of the suffering of the divinity, of the exile of, the, of Providence, who, according to the Kabbalah, awaits his deliverance in that of man. I got to know him toward the end of 1941. I was 12, but I believe profoundly. During the day, I studied the Talmud, and at night, I ran to the synagogue to weep over the destruction of the temple. One day I asked my father to find me a master to guide me in my studies of the Kabbalah. You're too young for that. My mind said it was only at thirty that one had the right to venture into the polarious world of mysticism. You must first study the basic subjects within your own understanding. My father was a culture cultured, rather unsentimental man. There was never any display of emotion, even at home. He was more concerned with others than his own family. The Jewish community in Seget held him in the greatest esteem. They often used to consult him about the public matters and even about private ones. There were four of us children, Hilda, the eldest, then Bea, I was the third, and the only son, the, the baby of the family, was Teropa. My parents ran a shop. Hilda and Bea helped them with the work. As for me, they said my place was at school. There aren't any Kabbalists at Seget, my father would repeat. He wanted to drive the notion out of my head, but it was in vain. I found a master for myself, Mosh the Beetle. He had noticed me one day at dusk when I was praying. Why do you weep when you pray, he asked me, as though he had known me a long time. I don't know why, I answered, greatly disturbed. The question had never entered my head. I wept because of something inside me that felt the need for tears. That was all I knew. Why do you pray, he asked after a moment. Why did I pray? A strange question. Why did I live? Why did I breathe? I don't know why. I said even more disturbed and ill, and Ill at ease. I don't know why. After that day, I saw him often. And he, he explained to me with great insistence that every question possessed a power that did not lie in the answer. Man raises himself toward God by the questions he asked him. He was fond of repeating. That is the true dialogue. Man questions God and God answers, but we don't understand his answers. We can't understand them because they come from the depths of the soul and they stay in there until death. You will find the true answers, Elizer, only within yourself. And why do you pray, Moss? I asked him. I pray to the God within me that he will give me the strength to ask him the right questions. We talked like this nearly every evening. We used to stay in the synagogue after all the faithful had left, sitting in the gloom where a few half-burned candles still gave a flickering light. One evening I told him how unhappy I was because I could not find a master in Seget to instruct me in the Zohar, the Kab Kabbalist books, The Secrets of Jews, Jewish Mysticism. He smiled indignantly. After a long silence, he said, There are a thousand and one gates leading into the orchard of the mystical truth. Every human begins at his own gate. We must never make the mistake of wanting to enter the or 
orchard, orchard by any gate but our own. To do this is dangerous for the one who enters and also for those who are already there. The Mosh and Beetle, the poor barefoot of Seget, talk to me for long hours of the revelations and mysteries and mysteries of the Kabbalah. It was him that my initiation began. We would read together ten times over the same page of Zohar. Not to learn it by heart, but to extract the divine essence from it. And although those evenings a conviction grew in me that Mosh and the Beetle would draw me with him into eternity, into that time, where question and answer would become one. Then one day they expelled all the foreign Jews from Seget. The Moss, the Beetle, was a foreigner. Crammed into cattle trains by Hungarian police, they wept bitterly. We stood on the platform and wept too. The train disappeared on the horizon. It left nothing behind but its thick, dirty smoke. I heard a Jew behind, behind me heave a sigh. What can we expect, he said. It's war. The deportees were soon forgotten. A few days after they had gone, people were saying that they had arrived in Galcia, were working there, and were even satisfied with their lot. Several days passed, several weeks, several month, months. Life had returned to normal. A wind of calmness and reassurance blew through our houses. The traders were doing good business. The students lived buried in their books, and the children played in the streets. One day, as I was going into the synagogue, I saw sitting on the bench near the door, Mosh the Beetle. He told a story and that of his companions. The train full of deportees had crossed the Hungarian frontier and on, and on Polish territory had been taken in charge of this Gaspato. There it had stopped. The Jews had to get out and climb into lorries. The lorries drove toward a forest. The Jews were made to get out. They were made to dig huge graves. And then... And when they had finished their work, the Gestapo began theirs. Without passion, without haste, they slaughtered their prisoners. Each one had to go up to the hole and present his neck. Babies were thrown into the air, and, and the machine gunners used them as targets. This was in the forest of Galcia, near Colome. How had Moss, the beetle, escaped? Miraculously, he was wounded in the leg and taken for dead. Though long days and nights... He went from one Jewish house to another, telling the story of Makal, Malka, the young girl who had taken three days to die, and of Tobias, the tailor, who had begged to be killed before his sons. Mosh had changed. There was no longer any joy in his eyes. No, he no longer sang. He no longer talked to me of God or of the Kabbalah, but only of what he had seen. People refused not only to believe his stories, but even listen to them. He's just trying to make us pity him. What an imagination he has, they said. Or even, poor fellow, fellow, he's gone mad. As for Mosh, he wept. Jews, listen to me. It's all I ask of you. I don't want money or pity. Only listen to me. He would cry between prayers at dusk and the evening prayers. I did not believe him myself. I would sit, often sit with him in the evening after the service, listening to his stories and trying his, my hardest to understand his grief. I felt only pity for him. They take me for a madman, he would whisper, and tears like drops of wax flowed from his eyes. Once I asked him this question, why are you so anxious that people should believe what you say? In your place, I shouldn't care whether they believe me or not. He closed his eyes as though to escape time. You don't understand, he said in despair. You can't understand. I have been saved miraculously. I managed to come back here. Where did I get the strength from? I wanted to come back to Seget to tell the story of my death, so that you could prepare yourselves while there was still time. To live? I don't attach any importance to, to my life anymore. I'm alone. No, I wanted to come back, and to warn you, and see how it is, and no one else will listen to me. That was toward the end of 1942. Afterward, life returned to normal. The London radio, which we listened to every evening, gave us heartening news. The daily bombardment of Germany, Stalingrad, preparation for the Second Front, and we, the Jews of Seget, were waiting for better days, which would not be long in coming now. I continued to devote myself to my studies. By day, the Talmud, at night, the Kabbalah. My father was occupied with business and the doings of the community. 
my grandfather had come to celebrate the new year with us so that he could attend the services of the famous rabbi of Borsch. My mother began to think that it was the high time to find a suitable young man for Hilda. Thus, the year 1943 passed by. Spring 1944, good news from the Russian front. No doubt could remain now of Germany's defeat. It was only a question of time, or months, or weeks perhaps. The trees were in blossom. This was the year like any other when it's springtime, it's brothels, it's weddings, and births. People said, the Russian army's making a gigantic stride forward. Hitler won't be able to do us any harm even if he wants to. Yes, we even doubled that he wanted to exterminate us. Yes, we even doubted that he wanted to exterminate us. He was going to wipe out a whole po Was he going to wipe out a whole people? Could he exterminate a population scattered throughout so many countries? So many millions? What methods could he use? In the middle of the 20th century. Besides, people were interested in, any, in everything in strategy, in diplomacy, in politics, in Zionism. But not in their own faith. Fate. Even Mosh the Beetle was silent. He was weary of speaking. He wandered in the synagogue or in the streets with his eyes down, his back bent, avoiding people's eyes. At the time, it was possible to attain immigration, perhaps, for pal permits for Palestine. I had asked my father to sell out, liquidate his business, and leave. I'm too old, my son, he replied. I'm too old to start a new life. I'm too old to start from scratch again in a country so far away. The Budapest radio announced that the fascist party had come into power. Hordery had been forced to ask one of the leaders of the nihilist party to form a new government. Still, this was not enough to worry us. Of course, we had heard about the fascists, but they were still just an abstraction to us. This was only a change in the administration. The following day, there was more disturbing news. With government permission, the German troops had entered Hungarian territory. Here and there, anxiety was aroused. One of our friends, Berkovitz, who had just returned from the capital, told us, The Jews in Budapest are living in an atmosphere of fear and terror. There are anti-Semitic incidences every day. In the streets, in the trains, the fascists are attacking Jewish shops and synagogues. The situation is getting very serious. This news spread like wildfire through, through Seged. Soon it was on everyone's lips, but not for long. Optimism soon revived. The Germans won't get us as far as this. They'll stay in Budapest. There are strategic, there are strategic and political reasons. Before three days had passed, German army cars had appeared in our streets. Ang anguish. German soldiers with their steel helmets and their emblem, the Death's Hand. However, our first impressions of the Germans were most reassuring. The officers were belittled in private houses, even in the homes of Jews. Their attitude toward their host was distant but polite. They never demanded the impossible, made no unpleasant comments, and even smiled occasionally at the mistress of the house. One German officer lived in the house opposite ours. He had a room with the Kahn family. They said he was a charming man, calm, likable, polite, and sympathetic. Three days after he moved, in he brought Madame Kahn a box of cho chocolates. The optimist rejoiced. Well, there you are, you see. What did we tell you? You wouldn't believe us. There, there they are your Germans. What do you think of them? Where is their famous cruelty? The Germans were already in town. The fascists were already in power. The verdict had already been pronounced. Yet... The Jews of Seget continued to smile. The week of Passover, the weather was wonderful. My mother was bustled around her kitchen. There were no longer any synagogues to open. We gathered in private houses. The Germans were not to be provoked. Pra practically every rabbi's flat became a house of prayer. We drank, we ate, we sang. The Bible bade us rejoice during the seven days of the feast. To be happy, but our hearts were not in it. Our hearts had been beating more rapidly for some days. We wished the feast were over so that we could not have to play this comedy any longer. On the seventh day of Passover, the cruelty, the, the curtain rose. 
the Germans arrested the leaders of the Jewish community. For that moment, everything happened very quickly. The race toward death had begun. The first step, Jews would not be allowed to leave their houses for three days, on pain of death. Mosh the Beetle came running to our house. I warned you, he cried to my father, and without waiting for a reply, he fled. The same day, the Hungarian police burst into all the Jewish houses on the street. A Jew no longer had the right to keep his house gold, jewels, or any objects of value. Everything had to be handed over to the authorities, on pain of death. My father went down to the cellar and buried our savings. At home, my mother continued to busy herself with her usual task. At times, she would pause and gaze at us, silent. When, when the three days were up, there, were a new, there was a new decree. Every Jew must wear the yellow star. Some of the prominent members of the community came to see my father, who had highly placed connections in the Hungarian police, to ask him what he thought of the situation. My father did not consider it so grim, but perhaps he did not want to dishearten the others or rub salt in their wounds. The yellow star? Oh well, what of it? You don't die of it. Poor father, of what then did you die? But already they were in issuing new decrees. We were no longer to go into the restaurants or cafes, to travel on the railway, to attend the synagogue, to go out into the street after six o'clock. Then came the ghetto. Two ghettos were set up in Seget, a large one in the center of town, occupied four streets, and another smaller one extended over several small side streets in the outlying district. The street where we lived, Serpent Street, was inside the first ghetto. We still lived, therefore, in our own house, but as it was at the corner, the windows facing the outside street had to be blocked up. We gave up some of our rooms to the relatives who had been driven out of their flats. Little by little, life returned to normal. The barbed wire fence, w the barbed wire which fenced us in, did not cause us any real fear. We even thought of ourselves rather, rather well off. We were entirely self-contained, a little Jewish republic. We appointed a Jewish council, a Jewish police, an office for social assistance, a labor committee, a hygiene department, and a whole, a whole government machinery. Everyone marveled at it. We should no longer have before our eyes those hostile faces, those hate-laden star stars, hate-laden stares. Our fear and anguish were at an end. We were living among Jews, among brothers. Of course, there were still some unpleasant moments. Every day the Germans came to fetch men to stoke coal, to stoke coal on the military trains. There were not many volunteers for work of this kind, but apart from the atmosphere was peaceful and reassuring. The general opinion was that we were going to remain in the ghetto until the end of the war, until the arrival of the Red Army. Then everything would be as before. It was neither German nor Jew who ruled the ghetto. It was an illusion. On Saturday before Pentecost, in the spring sunshine, people strolled carefree and unheeded. Unheadingly, unheading. Through the swarming of streets, through storming of streets, they chatted happily. The children played games on the pavements. With some of the school, with some of my schoolmates, I sat with Erza Malik Gardens, studying a treatise on the Talmud. Night fell. There were twenty people gathered in our backyard. My father was telling them anecdotes and expounding his own views on the situation. He was a good storyteller. Suddenly the gate opened and, and a stern, a former tradesman who had become a pol policeman, came in and took my father aside. Despite the gathering dusk, I saw my father turn pale. What's the matter? We all asked him. I don't know. I've been summoned to an extraordinary meeting of the council. Something must have happened. The good story he had been in the middle of telling us was to remain unfinished. I'm going there, he went on. I shall be back as soon as I can. I'll tell you all about it. Wait for me. We prepared to wait for some hours. The back yard became like a hall, became like the hall outside an operating, operating room. We were only waiting for the door to open, to see the opening of ferment itself. Other neighbors, having heard rumors, had come to join us. People looked at their watches. The time passed very slowly. What could such a long meeting mean? 
I've gone. I've got a promotion of evil, said my mother. This afternoon, I know some new faces in the ghetto. Two German police officers from the Gestapo, I believe. Since we've been here, not a single officer has ever shown himself.